Hello, so it's Friday the 12th of February and campus is closed because it's snowy and it's icy and it's slippery. A lot of people have power out. I don't have internet at home. So I guess it's certainly understandable why we're not having class today, but the show must go on. We've got too much good stuff to cover and not enough time to get it all done. So I'm providing this video as a resource and a reference that you should uh, go through in pretty good detail before our class on Monday. So before we get into it, the, ma the majority of this uh, lecture is gonna be used from a previous semester, but I did want to give you updated announcements, just uh, that homework four, as previously announced, is due on Wednesday, the 17th of February. And as you're working on that, keep in mind that um, you're gonna use the, uh, the nodal method to solve the problems there. You're not gonna be applying the Hardy Cross method problems, uh, the Hardy Cross method that uh, is illustrated today and in Monday's class. And so uh, this is really good stuff. I regret that we don't get to meet in person and I'd love to teach it to you uh, directly, but this recorded lecture is gonna have to do. If you have questions, please reach out, let me know. I've got Microsoft Teams. I've got telephone, I've got email, so those are all good ways for you to get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. Hope you have a good weekend and stay safe. Uh, here's the system. And uh, of course the fully, fully turbulent flow equation for Jane, you know, if we're assuming just during the first iteration that things are fully turbulent. What you need to find on this problem is the flow rate through each pipe and then the flow in and out of the reservoirs. And um, to solve the problem, you have to start by assuming a flow direction. And so let me write on the whiteboard here just to illustrate what I mean. We've got junction A, B, C, and D. All right, so flow comes in at junction C, 0 0.2 cubic meters per second. So where does it go when it gets in there? Let's assume, and this may not be right, we're gonna go through some calculations and assume that, that it's this way, but if the flow rates just kind of don't add up, like if the, uh, the uh, continuity isn't uh, honored at a junction, then we know that our flow assumptions was wrong. Let's say that the flow goes this way and it goes that way. And so what we know at junction C is we know that QAC plus QBC is 0 0.2. Now, does everybody understand where that statement came from? Because flow in equals flow out. So if 0.2 comes in to junction C, 0.2 has to go out of junction C. So I don't know how much is in pipe AC. I don't know what the flow rate is, but I know together AC and BC together are 0.2. Um, okay, there's also 0.2 coming out at junction D, 0.2. So maybe I'll assume that there is flow so that um, QBD plus Q, A, D are equal to 0 0.2. So that's at a separate node, continuity for that node. Um, now what about the amount of energy or the head? Well, we know the head at A. And so the head at A is 25 meters. So H, a is 25 meters. Now what about the head at C? The head at C. Now based on this assumption of the flow direction, I assumed the flow is going from C towards A. So is there going to be more head at C or less head at C if the flow is coming from C towards A? Which has more energy? The upstream location or the downstream location? The upstream location. So location C has more head. So what we could say is that the head at C is the head at A plus 
R times Q squared. R Q squared. Um, because of the flow direction. And we could also say that the head at C, the head at, okay, so we knew it's 25 meters here, and at junction B, it's 20 meters. We also know that the head at C is the head at B plus R Q squared. And the Q that I'm talking about here is Q A C. And the Q that I'm talking about here is the Q B C. All right, so this is an equation that I know. This is an equation that I know. We've got this one and that one. And then there's two more equations, statements that we could make about head. OK, so we said the head at C in terms of the flow through this pipe and the flow through this pipe. Uh, we can also say, what is the head at D? And so the head at D is the head at A. And now because of the flow direction, it's going to be minus because energy always goes from, the flow goes from high energy to low energy. So the head at A minus R Q A D squared. So this is another equation where I know something. What about, how would we say what is the head at D in terms of the head at B? Well, it would be the head at D is the head at B minus R Q B D squared. Now by R, that just means resistance. And so what we're doing with the R is we're combining all of the terms together that cause resistance to flow through a pipe. So we're combining the friction loss term, the pipe length, the cross-sectional area, the diameter. So these are some hints that I hope can help you to solve this homework problem. When you've got this many equations, statements of what we know, um, you can find out by setting these two terms equal to each other, you can find the ratio between QAD and QBD. You know, like how much one is in terms of the other, and then substitute it into this one. So it's the idea of two equations, two unknowns. Individually, we wouldn't know the flow rate AD versus BD, but we can find one in terms of the other and then substitute it into the continuity equation and find actually how much flow is there. Now I'll give you one more hint on this problem and that is so you'll follow that approach and find the flow rate through these pipes and uh, there's also water coming from this reservoir entering at junction A. So some water's coming in at A and you'll be able to determine how much that is just by uh, these equations that are on, on the whiteboard here. This is kind of like a, a brain teaser type problem. It's like a, a puzzle as much as it is calculation and hydraulics. It's a puzzle just fitting together the head at each location in terms of the flow rate. This is just all kind of a summary of what I wrote on the board. But the one last thing I'll tell you is that once you find the flow rates through each pipe, then you're going to need to check the fully turbulent flow assumption to see if it's accurate. And I think um, what you'll have to do is you'll have to do the whole process over a second time with updated F values. And I mean, it won't be like starting from scratch because you'll kind of know the structure of solving for one flow rate in terms of another. Just what will change is the R value will be slightly different in your second iteration. So the, the flow rates will change slightly once you use the full Jane equation instead of just the fully turbulent flow assumption. All right. So that assignment, again, just as a reminder, is due on Wednesday. So that gives us some extra time for you to work on this over the weekend. 
and then ask me questions on Monday if you've got any. Okay, the loop method is more complicated than the nodal method. The nodal method works good if we just have maybe pipes in flow splitting and going in parallel, but more complicated than that, and we need a more sophisticated uh, calculation procedure, and the Hardy-Cross method does that. It's kind of interesting because there are some, um, some ways that the Hardy-Cross method is used in structural analysis. It's, it's in a computational process that's used both in hydraulic analysis and in structural analysis, and so you'll maybe uh, see some similarities if you've been through the structural analysis course before. So consider what if water came into a pipe network and then it exited in two locations and the water could go a lot of different routes to get there. And there's so many different paths and what we want to know is how much of the water went through each of these pipes. Um, it requires an initial guess to kick things off and then lots of iterations along the way in order to find out uh, what is the, uh, the answer in the end. And you can do it by hand. It's really time consuming. And we won't bother doing one of these by hand. We're going to skip right into spreadsheets. But this Hardy-Cross method is what the uh, Water Gems program is based on. And you've used Water Gems just in a really initial sense during uh, fluid mechanics. And you're going to use it a lot for our design project later on. So I do think it's important for you to understand how Water Gems is working and what calculations it's considering in the background. So that's why we'll do this by spreadsheet today with a couple of examples. And then you'll have a homework problem uh, that also needs you to do that. Um, the way that it works is it does an energy balance for all of the different routes. And remember what we said in last class was it doesn't matter which route you take to ski down the hill. If you start at the top, and you end at the bottom, your delta Z, the energy change, is the same. And so that applies in a complicated pipe network as well. If the water enters at one location, and if we take another outlet point, it doesn't matter which way, which path the water takes to get from the inlet to the outlet, through each of the paths that it takes, the head loss has to be the same. So that's the basis of this calculation method, is energy balance. Um, the R value I already mentioned briefly when we were talking about that homework problem, the R meaning resistance. Um, in the Darcy-Wiesbach equation, we have F L V squared divided by D2G. And that is what we use to calculate the head loss due to pipe friction. So what R does, as you can see here in, in this equation, is it says instead of the FLV squared divided B by D2G, it's FLQ squared divided by D2GA squared. And so instead of having velocity, we would substitute in the flow rate squared divided by the cross-sectional area squared. And then all of these terms are combined together into R, the resistance factor. Um, and you could use the Hazen-Williams method for calculating the pipe loss due to head, uh, the energy loss due to pipe friction. But the Darcy-Wiesbach is what we're going to learn because it's kind of like the uh, the most accurate. We'll go all the way, use the most accurate method, even though it's a little bit harder. So here's the R value. And just to get some practice calculating R, what if we had water going at 400 liters per second through a concrete pipe? We know the length. So to find R, what we need to do is find the Reynolds number, substitute it into the Jane equation, and then calculate the resistance. Now, rather than having you practice that, let's just take a look at the solution and then move on. Because I think that uh, saving as much time as possible for the Hardy-Cross method itself is what would be better. So here is calculating resistance We've done a lot of examples so far. All right, here we go. So we are given a flow rate. We are given a diameter. 
an epsilon, a length. So with the diameter, you're calculating the cross-sectional area. You find the velocity, which you'll use to determine the Reynolds number. So substituting that into the Jane equation gives you an F value. And then you substitute the F, L, 2, G, A squared, and D. And so that would be the resistance factor. And so what the resistance factor means is that the flow rate can go up and down, but this R value would be constant. No matter what the flow rate changes, the R value is kind of like all of the other components <coughs> besides the flow rate that would contribute to resistance in flow. All right, so for the Hardy Cross procedure, this is a simple pipe network that has two loops. What this is showing, it's unitless right now. We can do an example with units a little bit later. But let's say that there are 100 units of flow going into this junction. 50 units go out at one junction here, 30 exit the network at another, 20 go out here. Uh, there are R values for each of these pipes having to do with how long they are, the diameter, uh, the friction factor, and so on. So the, uh, the R values are just an indication of resistance. And so for instance, if 100 units goes into this junction, what we know is there's more resistance through this pipe than through that one. And so we'd guess that if the water is splitting and going two different directions, a little more water is going to go through this pipe because there's less resistance. And a little bit less water would go up through this vertical pipe because the resistance is higher there. Um, the n value that we're going to use in this formula is 2 because that is the uh, n value that's used when you're utilizing the Darcy-Wiesbach equation. Um, we have to define a, uh, a convention for flow direction. And what we're going to assume is that clockwise is positive. And um, so when clockwise is positive, then let me show you what that does to the flow rates and flow directions that we have to assume. OK, so here's our simple pipe network. And flow comes in at one junction, and there's 100 units there. It goes out with 30, 50, and 20. And then the, uh, the pipe is connecting so that there's two loops. Um, what we're going to have is a situation where we'll label the pipes. And let me just find my notes because I want to make sure that we label it the same thing. All right. Let's call this top junction, junction 1. On the top left, junction 2, junction 3, and junction 4. The hardest thing that students sometimes struggle with is the initial flow rates. Um, all we have to do is assign guess flow rates at each junction. And it doesn't have to be right. You know, The iteration is going to find the actual flow rate. All we have to do is we have to make it so that in and out balances at each junction. So for instance, um, with pipe 3, 4, let's assume that, um, first of all, clockwise is positive. So that's our, our direction notation. But of the initial 100 that comes in, just to make sure that it all balances out, let's say 30 goes that way and 70 goes this way as our initial guess. So at junction 4, it 100 in and 100 out. Now, realistically, I told you earlier that more flow would go through pipe 3, 4. But the program will figure that out. It'll find the end flow rates as long as at each junction everything is in balance. OK, so now what about pipe? Um, Let's see, junction 2. 50 is going out. 
So we just will say, let's assume that there's 25 going this way and 25 going that way to give us the 50. So 25 in, 25 in makes 50 in total, and there's 50 going out. Okay, so now what about junction 1? We have 70 going in, and so far only 40 is going out. There's the 20 that's going out externally, and then the 25 that's going out from 1 to 2. So how much and what flow direction does that tell us for pipe 1, 3? 70 in, and right now 45 out. So how much has to be coming out through this pipe? Seventy minus twenty <laughs> minus twenty-five equals what is it? Twenty-five. How much? Twenty-five. Twenty-five. So it's fifty <laughs> minus twenty-five. All right. So it's going to be twenty-five going out. Now let's double check at the other junction down here. Okay. So what we say is how much is going in and how much is going out. We've got fifty-five going in and then 55 going out. So at all of those junctions right now, continuity is, is satisfied. All right. Um, now that we've got that, what we're going to do is we're going to put it into a spreadsheet that has these labels. And the, uh, the spreadsheet uh, template file that I gave you, um, we're going to apply this formula to find corrections in the flow rate and then the final flow rate in the end. Okay, so um, I think here is the starting file and it's got here an example one. Oh, you don't have the solution, do you? It's blank, right? I hope. I hope yours doesn't already have the solution like mine does. All right. Is it blank? Yes, yes good. All right. <laughs> Okay, in the first iteration, this bottom loop, we're going to call loop one. Okay, so iteration one, and we are going to start our calculations with loop one. You can follow along if you've got the uh, spreadsheet. If you don't, that's okay too. You can watch what I'm doing, and then um, if you bring your class, uh, your uh, computer to class on Monday, we'll continue additional examples. All right, so. We're going to start with pipe 1, 3. I guess I'll have to put in the uh, quotation, 1-3. Otherwise, it thinks I mean January 3rd. OK, the end value for all of these is going to be 2, because we're using the Darcy-Wiesbach method for energy loss. If we were using the Hazen-Williams, then it would be 1.85. <coughs> but we're using Darcy-Wiesbach, so n equals 2. The r values are just given. So pipe 1, 3, you can see the R value is 3. Let's put in the data for the other pipes in that loop. There is also pipe 1-4. Let's which has an R value of 6. And there's pipe 3-4, which has an R value of 5. And now we'll put in the guess flow rates that I wrote on the whiteboard. And the direction relative to this clockwise arrow tells us if it's positive or if it's negative. So the flow through pipe 1, 3, we said it's 25 going from 1 towards 3 as our initial guess. So that's going to be positive 25. Pipe 1, 4. We said it's 70 going from 4 towards 1. So that's positive 70. Now 3, 4 is negative because the 30 that goes from 4 towards 3, see that's an opposite direction from the clockwise arrow. So the clockwise arrow from the perspective of loop 1, it's going the opposite direction than that arrow for the 30. So it's negative 30. Okay, now for each one, we say 
the R times Q times the absolute value of Q. Okay, and we can drag that down through the other two in that loop. So that is the numerator of this function. Now the denominator of this function is n times r times absolute value of q. That's the denominator in this function. <coughs> And we also need to have the sum of the three things that are in that loop. Because you notice in the function it says the sum. So it is the sum of these, and then the sum of the n times r times absolute value of q. Now delta q is the negative of that divided by that. So I'm going to say equals negative this one, the numerator, divided by that one. Don't anchor the reference. Okay. We have to type that formula in manually three times. Oh, did I do the negative? I did in the first one. Equals negative this divided by that equals negative that divided by that. The reason why we don't anchor the reference and why we bother to type it in manually three times is we're going to copy and paste in subsequent iterations and we don't want it to always look up here in the first iteration. We want it to be a relative reference. Okay, so the corrected Q is our initial guess flow rate plus the correction factor. I guess it's a correction amount. So we now have a corrected flow rate for each pipe. So that's loop one. It all started off with our initial flow rates. Now loop two, let's uh, start with loop two. And the pipes that we have are pipe 1-2, there's pipe 2-3, and pipe 1-3. Pipe 1-3 is in both loop 1 and in loop 2. It's in both loops. Okay, the n is 2 for all of them. We'll copy over the r values. Okay, so pipe 1, 2, the R value is 1. Pipe 2, 3, the R value is 2. And it's 3 for pipe 1, 3. Okay, the guess flow rates that are on the board. Um, okay, pipe 1, 2, 25. And is it positive or negative for pipe 1, 2? Positive. That's right, it's positive because it's in the same direction as that clockwise arrow that's in the center of the loop. Pipe 2, 3, negative 25, because it's in the opposite direction. You see the clockwise arrow is going down, but that flow is going up. Okay, now here's a tricky warning. Uh, you don't put in your original estimate for this pipe 1, 3. Um, you know, our original estimate was 25, but we have an updated guess of the flow rate from this iteration, like over here. So rather than using our old value, let's use the updated value. So our updated flow rate, the magnitude of it is 4.24, but when we're in loop two, the flow direction changes. So this is really important. I'm going to say it two more times. That's how important it is. When you go from loop 1 to loop 2, you have to put a negative sign. So this negative sign that I'm doing right now equals negative of that. The minus sign is because 
Pipe one, three, the flow direction is different from the perspective of loop two. It's a negative flow rate. But when we're looking at loop one, it's a positive flow rate. So it's a matter of perspective. So that's why I put the negative value, and then I referred to the corrected flow rate. OK. So now I think what I can do is just copy both of these, control C, control V, and it will automatically calculate the applicable R times Q times absolute value of Q. It will sum them up at the bottom for the loop two. It will do the N times R times absolute value of Q. It will sum them up at the bottom. Now, of course, it's stupid to show that much digits. It's just distracting, so I'm going to turn that down. Turn down the stupid. <laughs> All right. All right, now we have to type in the equation again, though. So the delta Q, it's this formula. So equals minus this divided by that. Equals minus this divided by that. Equals minus, oh, I forgot the minus. Minus this divided by that. You can't just type it in once and then drag down. It, it won't automate the way that we want if we do. OK, so then the corrected Q is equals the original guess plus the correction factor, plus this one. Now you can tell how close you are to convergence by the size of the delta Q. What do I mean by convergence? Like in an iteration type problem, what is convergence? You get the same answer. You're getting the same answer from iteration to iteration. It means that things have settled down, the calculations aren't changing anymore, and you've finally stabilized on the right answer. So if the delta Q is what changes your initial guess and the final guess, what we're looking for is a small delta Q. That's our convergence criteria, is if the flow rates aren't changing anymore, we know we have the right flow rates. All right. So that's the end of iteration one. Now there's iteration two. The great thing is, is that I think we just did everything we need to do for iteration two and typing in that number. All the rest of it, we can just copy, paste, and then we're going to make a couple of changes. So control C, <coughs> control V. Now here's the changes we're going to make. We don't want to begin iteration two with this initial dumb guess of the flow rate. We have a better guess for our flow rate now. So instead of starting back over at 25, our new guess flow rate for 1, 3 is equals minus that flow rate. So I put in the minus sign because I went from the perspective of loop 1, and I got the loop 2 flow rate. So anytime you have this common pipe, that's why it's in bold. Did you notice, by the way, that it's in bold? I think it's a good practice to bold any pipe that is in more than one loop just so you have that visual reminder that you have to uh, use the negative sign and update the most recent, F, uh, most recent flow rate value. OK, so I have a better guess for that flow rate. What's my best guess for a 1, 4? It's not 70. I've improved on it. My best guess for 1, 4 is that one. My guess, best guess for 3, 4 is this one. OK. And now what about down here in loop 2? Just one second. OK, so I'm going to update these guesses, and then I'll circulate around, and we'll see if there's any uh, fixing that needs to be done. So the best guess of 1, 2 is this one. The best guess of 2, 3 is that. All right, it's 
So let me pause for a moment and see how it's going on your spreadsheets. If you have any differences, we can try and figure out what those might be from. <laughs> Okay, so the, the two most common mistakes that I see, like on a quiz or an exam, the two most common mistakes are number one, forgetting to uh, use the most recent guess of the flow rate. So for instance, down here when I'm starting the flow rate for pipe 1-3, I need to use this value because it's the most recent guess I've got for pipe 1-3. And of course the negative sign because that was the flow rate from the perspective of loop 1 and this is that same common pipe in loop excuse me, we're in loop one now and the, the previous guess was in loop two. So that's one mistake. The other is the minus sign sometimes gets forgotten. Like when you're typing that equation in, don't forget the minus sign in the function. So what you notice is look at the delta Q in the first iteration. It was 20 units of flow. Now we're down to 1.5 units of flow. Things are definitely headed in the right direction. It's getting a lot closer. Iteration 3 is even easier. All we have to do is just select and copy. Um, copy, paste, and this time we don't even have to fix the input flow rates. All of the references are relative. Look how small that delta Q is getting. It's essentially uh, the flow rates have converged. If I do a fourth iteration, these corrected flow rates aren't going to be really much different. Look at the common pipe. Initially, it was saying, well, the flow rate is 4. No, the fl flow rate is 0.3. Well, maybe 1, 1.5. So it's getting closer. You know, it's 1.1 in both of them. So if I do one further, iteration, control C, control V, we'll find that the flow rates aren't changing at all. The delta Q is zero, which means that the solution is fully converged. So these are the, the answer flow rates. So that's the essence of the Hardy Cross method. Are there any questions about what we've done or why we did it? I have a question. Yeah. Is the R related to the reference since it's the, like the epsilon? Yes. But it's also related to the flow rate. Like we know that F value depends on velocity. So this example that I just worked is kind of oversimplified because what you had here was fixed R values. The reality is, is that the R value depends on F value, and F depends on Reynolds number. So if we had a big flow rate versus a small flow rate, the, uh, the R value is going to change. And so the example that we'll work on Monday, we're going to get a little bit more sophisticated. We won't have a fixed R value anymore, but we'll calculate an F value that from iteration to iteration it adjusts. We just did this first example kind of so that you could learn the structure and the method of the solution. But I'm glad you were thinking about that. So 